Hi, this is Tom Kemp. I'm the CEO of Centrify, and I'm joined with Mike Patnode, our Director of Engineering. And today we're going to cover a topic that comes up with some of our customers, and it has to do with group and group measure membership with Active Directory and Direct Control. So, Mike, uh, what is, from your perspective, you know, what comes up from a customer perspective um, that may be a little bit confusing to, to customers? Well, there's a couple of things. There's, <coughs> we have, usually our customers come in one or two groups, Unix users or Active Directory users. Unix users have one expectation on how group membership is going to work, and Active Directory users have another expectation on how group membership works. And as, and one of the interesting things Centrified Direct Control does is it allows you to leverage a lot of the powerful functions that Microsoft has put into Active Directory groups that aren't necessarily available in Unix groups per se. So one of the things I like to talk about is basically sort of do a review of both of them and then talk about how they merge together. Yeah, that'd be good. So which one do you want to start with? Do you want to start with the how about Active Directory groups or Unix groups? Yeah, so why don't we start with Unix groups. Okay. And with the Unix groups, with Unix group membership, there are two interesting types of groups. There's your primary group, and there's your supplemental group list. So your primary group, and this is one of the interesting things that gets a little confusing uh, in the Unix world, especially for um, Active Directory users, your primary group is specified in your user attribute. So there's usually a primary group ID, you see a GID term used a lot, which is going to be the group that by default all your files get created with that group identifier attached to them. And one of the things that catches people a little off guard is typically on a Unix system, when you actually list the members of the primary of a member's primary group, they're actually not necessarily a member of that group. And the reason is is because it's actually embedded in the user information itself, in the user's password information on the Unix side. So um, so a lot of things we'll find is people will actually they'll run the uh, they'll run the command get it group and they'll put in a, a user group name here and let's say let's say it's Mike group let's say it's the group that uh, just has my username in it or my primary group and they won't see any users listed there and the reason is is that even though Mike is a member of that group. And the reason, the only reason I'm a member of that group is because that's what my primary group ID is set to. Meanwhile, for Unix supplemental groups, for those, you do have to be actually a member of the group itself. And these are uh, typically in Unix, these are, were, used to be uh, managed in the Etsy group file. And of course, one of the things Centrified Direct Control does for you is moves that information into Active Directory. Okay. So uh, that sets the stage from a Unix perspective. Uh, are there any specific limitations as it relates to groups that, that maybe more Active Directory-centric people bump into that, that you want to talk to? Yeah, there's actually a couple interesting things there. One is, on a, uh, is, first of all, a member on Unix can only be a member typically of 16 or up to 32 groups. And this is a limitation that's actually imposed by the NFS protocol. And it's one of the reasons why it's not as easy as just bumping up a kernel parameter or something of that nature. So uh, one of the things that Centrify will be providing in a future release is a command to allow you to choose what groups you're currently a member of at any given certain time. So in Active Directory, you might be a member of thousands of groups, but when you're logged on the Unix system, you can only be a member of 16 or maybe up to 32 groups at a time, depending on which OS you're working with. There's also another interesting limitation on, uh, on Solaris and as well as uh, Solaris, HPUX, and some versions of Linux with the number of, member, of number of users that can be in a given group. And then a very typical thing in Active Directory is to have thousands of users in a group. But in Unix, there's sort of a built-in assumption and this comes uh, sort of built in from the NIS world, that, there, uh, that the buffer that it holds a group membership can only have uh, 1024 characters in it. So it basically puts you down to somewhere like around, 
uh, oh, maybe 120, 150 users per group. And, uh, and many times uh, people will run the same command on a, on a Solera system, and they'll put in some big group name here, and it'll come back blank. And that's because as soon as Solaris sees more than uh, 150 users in the group or so, it gives up and doesn't print out anything at all. So there's a uh, couple of ways to approach that. One of the things that, uh, <clears throat> one of the ways that actually Sun recommends people uh, approach it is you essentially create another group, and we'll just call this one, you know, big group two. And so you put, you know, 100 users here, and uh, you put another 100 users here. And as long as these two groups have the same group ID, everything still works fine. So there's a couple. That, so that's one way to work around that problem. Now, with the zoning technology that we offer, I mean, because a user could actually have multiple Unix identities associated with a single Active Directory, and so potentially using the zoning technology, and, and you also would associate groups with the zone, then some, so correct me if I'm wrong, but some of these restrictions we can get around with, with the zones. Yeah, there's definitely some tricks we can play in the zones, and but what we have to do is the same thing um, in a... <coughs> when one of the things we're actually already doing for our NIST server is taking large groups and automatically splitting them into, into smaller group names like this. And that's a feature that will be coming out in the 3.4 release of the product. Okay. Um, all right, cool. So, is there anything else on the Unix side that we that uh, you want to talk about? Does that cover the? the no, that covers that covers the Unix side pretty uh, well. Okay, so now let's flip to the Active Directory side of things because it's again, so the Active Directory people are pretty familiar with groups, but uh, some of the Unix centric people may not be familiar with how AD handles groups. Right. Okay, so let me talk about AD groups. So AD has two types of sort of macro classifications of groups. There are security groups and distribution groups. For today, security groups are obviously used to manage security items and distribution groups are pretty much only used for exchange and email distribution lists. So we're not going to worry about those. Those aren't used with direct control. We're primarily interested in security groups. When it comes to security groups, there are three, actually four different types of security groups that we're interested in. The first is domain local. And domain local groups are security groups which are used to manage the resources in the local domain. There are also global groups, which are used to manage resources within a forest and there are also universal groups, which are also used to manage resources within the, so within the forest. The sort of key difference between global and universal groups is the actual member list. The reason Microsoft made two of these was an optimization having to do with copying information to the global catalog. So in a global group, the member list is is actually not populated back to the global catalog. So it's, uh, if, a, if a group, if a membership on a domain is changing quite often, that might cause a lot of replication traffic you want to avoid. But if you have a group, but obviously having the group membership in the global catalog makes accessing that data faster. So if you have a group that doesn't change quite as much, but you still want to have global scope across your entire forest, you can use a universal group which uh, will then have that information readily in the global catalog. Um, there's a couple uh, interesting restrictions on each of these as well. A uh, domain local group can hold, uh, obviously it can contain users, uh, and it can contain just about anything else. So it can contain other domain local groups, and it can also uh, contain universal groups and global groups. Now the other two are a little more restricted. A global group can only contain global groups and users, of course. And a universal group is similarly limited in that it can only hold 
universal groups, other universal groups, and users, and global groups. Finally, there's a third type of group called a built-in group, or a fourth type of group called a built-in group. And built-in groups are predefined groups in Active Directory, things like uh, there's a built-in users group, a built-in administrators group. These groups specifically should not be used with direct control. These cannot be Unix enabled within the direct, direct control. So the next question sort of stop, you stop and ask is, okay, well, which ones do I use when? So one of the key things about domain local groups is that they can only be used to control resources within the current domain. So if you're going to Unix enable a domain local group in your Centrify zone, one of the things you really have to be sure of is that the machine is actually joined to the same domain where this domain local group is defined. So you can have users from other domains in that in that group. There's no problem with that. But you want to make sure that the machine is joined to the same domain that the zone is, <coughs> that the group belongs to. So the group and the machine have to be in the same domain if you're going to use a domain local group. So oftentimes uh, zones may contain computers which are in multiple domains within the company. And if that's the case, then you really don't want to use domain local groups. In that case, you want to use global groups instead. And, uh, and the reason to use the global groups rather than the universal is simply to avoid the copying of the data back over to the, uh, to the uh, global catalog if not necessary. So Mike, here you, what about the scenario when a customer, say he's just deploying, he wants to deploy direct control on a single Solaris system. He may have a hundred users, maybe a dozen groups. So it's pretty straightforward uh, in terms of uh, during the migration process where we provide the migration wizard to map the UIDs to the Active Directory user accounts, okay? And then say these groups, say most of these groups, or if not all the groups, will be created as new AD groups. What do you recommend to the person migrating what they do in terms of how they classify or categorize these newly added groups. Again, it's, it may be a person that is the Unix administrator and he's been tasked with doing this. Sure. So uh, a couple options, and a lot of it's going to depend on how complicated your Active Directory forest or domain is. So if you just have a single domain controller and you don't have a very complicated system, um, I would either make them domain local or global groups. And by making them global groups, you sort of say you stay a little safer. As if your uh, if your Active Directory forest grows, you add more domains, uh, you'll be able to uh, easily use those same groups across multiple Unix systems, regardless of which domain in the forest they are joined to. And just remember, if you're going to use a domain local group, then you only want to then you're only going to be able to use that group if that Unix computer is joined to that particular domain. Now, if the groups are, are created or uh, the Unix groups are created as AD groups, is there the flexibility for people to go back and kind of reclassify or recategorize the groups? Actually, Active Directory does allow you to change the group type. Okay. So uh, uh, one of the things it will do is though is it will check your membership and it won't let you check, change the group type if it will break the rules of the, of the group membership. Mm -hmm. So if you are changing group types, you may need to shuffle the membership around. So where, I mean, so where do people get kind of, uh, you know, bump into some little bumps in the road as it relates to this whole, now, now that we've spent the time talking about, you know, how groups work within Unix, you know, how groups work within AD, the various types of groups, et cetera, you know, walk me through the couple top two or three tech support issues where people may hit some road, roadblocks or bumps where uh, that uh, we can provide some guidance to, to help them along here. Sure, that's a that, that's a that's a really good question. So the so the first one we'll see is when we're actually in our actual create user dialog, we have two options, and one is about the type of group you're going to use, and what it says is it talks about a normal group, and it talks about a private group for the user. 
and, and this is probably one of the most confusing aspects of our UI, there really is nothing special about a private group. And uh, people get very confused asking what this is. All private groups are is a reflection of how Linux and Solaris likes to deal with groups. And when you create a user in Solaris or in Linux, it does two things in the, in the regular Etsy password file, in the Etsy password file and group files. So it will put a, it'll put a user It'll put a user in the file, like Mike, and you know, and, and maybe there's some password data, and my UID, my primary group ID, and then my uh, home directory and my shell. Uh, then it will also, so this is an Etsy password, and then in the group file, it will create a group called Mike with that same group ID. And that's all we need, but that's all we mean when we talk about a private group is we're just talking about a single group that's only used by the user Mike and he's the only and and he and that is his primary group ID. And what's interesting is even on Linux and Solaris, the uh, Mike, notice Mike isn't actually listed as a member of this group. So when you select private group in our UI, we do that exact same thing. What we do is we create a group in We'll create a group in Active Directory, and actually we'll call it uh, Mike underscore group in this case, because uh, Active Directory has to have unique uh, user and group names; they can't overlap. And uh, and we'll give it a we'll give it the, the right GID. Let's just say it's 505 for argument's sake. And that's all the information that will be in that Active Directory group is that it's called Mike group and it's group 505. But then when the Mike user is created in Active Directory, well, his user ID may be 505 and his group ID is going to be 505. So that's what private group does. What normal group does is basically we're just saying, okay, it's not a special group created just for Mike. It's maybe a group called Unix users or something like that where, all the, uh, where everybody has the same group ID. So maybe in that case, it'd be something like 10,000 for the Unix users group. And in that same case as well, there's a group called Unix users. And it's got a group ID of 10,000. But it also doesn't have any users listed into it because it's just used as a user's primary group. So having the information in the user's Etsy password entry or in our Unix password information that's kept in Active Directory is enough to make him a member of this group. He's not actually listed as a member of the group. Okay, so when people do this create user, so when would they select normal, when they would select private? I mean... So you're going to select private if you want to have this same sort of setup that you typically see in Unix. Okay. Where my username is Mike and my group name is Mike as you look in uh, my files in, in Unix. Gotcha. And if you want it to be, if you want all the users to share the same group, then you would pick normal group and pick a group for those users. Okay, great. So that's one scenario where, you know, people have some questions as it relates to AD versus Unix groups. Are there any other scenarios that, that have come up uh, yeah. where we've been working with customers? So there's another interesting hangover on how Unix deals with users and groups. And what many people have noticed that if I log into a computer and I log in as Mike, and is and this logging in as an log, AD? Uh, logging in as a, as a Unix enabled AD user? Unix enabled AD user. Okay. So I log in, I log in as Mike. Yep. And I'm sitting here at the shell and I run the command ID. And what ID will then do is it will list all the groups I'm a member of. So it tells me I'm Mike and here's my primary group and here's all the groups I'm a member of. And then they log in as a different user and they say ID and give it a, com a, pro uh, a command line argument of Mike. And what they'll notice is that these two lists actually won't match. And what they'll be missing from this, this list when you run the command this way is you'll be missing the primary group. Okay. And this is, a, this is because of the way that the ID command works. And what the ID command does in this case is it actually looks at the group membership that the kernel is aware of and lists that out. What the ID command does in this case 
is actually do a get and group, essentially, of every group on the system and search for the name Mike within those group lists. So remember back when we were talking to about how the user's primary group doesn't actually contain them as a member, they won't show up when this command is run. Okay. Okay, so that explains it. Um, any, any other, you know, technical issues that come up as it relates to Unix and AD groups uh, that uh, you think uh, need some more uh, discussion? So that's uh, so that's pretty much it. Because this, uh, although this looks funny on the command line, mm -hmm. it actually doesn't have any net effect on how the OS works. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, this is great. Well, thanks a lot. And so hopefully uh, this will be useful to our customers in terms of trying to uh, bridge uh, AD groups and, and Unix groups. And so hopefully this explanation uh, was of interest and useful. If you have any questions, uh, obviously contact uh, tech support at support at centrify.com or give us a call. And we look forward to uh, see you again on another one of our technical chalk talks. Thanks much. Bye-bye.